I called this meeting of the Duncanville Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of Board of Trustees is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. We will now move into closed session. I call this meeting of the Duncanville Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of board members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. We will now take action for closed session. Do I have a motion regarding the appointment of the Director of Fine Arts? So moved. Are there any questions, comments, discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Okay. And Kathleen is gonna introduce our new fine arts director. Good evening, Madam President, Board of Trustees, Dr. Smith. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our new Director of Fine Arts, Mr. Stephen Moth. Mr. Moth, if you would come. <laughs> Mr. Moss brings over 18 years of fine arts experience to his new role. He's earned, he earned his Bachelor of Music of, edu of Education from Henderson State University and a Master in Music from SMU. He has served as a band instructor and band director at the middle school and high school level. He currently serves as the director of band and the fine arts chair in Red Oak ISD. It is our pleasure to welcome Mr. Moss to the Duncanville family. Mr. Moss. Thank you. I'm gonna keep this very short. I'm just excited and most importantly, I'm very humbled uh, with this opportunity just to be able to work with the students and start developing relationships with everyone here. So I'm excited and most certainly humbled, and I appreciate it. Thank you. We will now move to the opening ceremonies and I ask Joe Barry Cruz to lead the invocation. Please stand. All right, let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, Lord, we come before you just humbly, humbled and just so grateful for all the rewards you've given us, Lord. I thank you for the safe travel of all our students and family to San Antonio and back. And we thank you for such great sportsmanship as always, Lord, I, I, I never take for granted the opportunity to serve with these outstanding board members and work with our senior leadership team. But as always, Lord, we pray for each one of our schools, our, our uh, principals, all the way down to the person that locks the door at the end of the day, that you may continue to just bless them and keep them. In your mighty name I pray, amen. 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 The students from Hardin Intermediate will lead us in the pledges. Please allow me to introduce Samantha Roman, Rachel Tavera, Olivia Harry, and Andrew Rubio.
I want to now turn the meeting over to Dr. Smith for the superintendent's report. We'll, we'll go ahead and move forward with the superintendent's report and then we'll, uh, the board will consider making adjustments on the board agenda here in just a moment. Um, so I just have a few quick reports uh, for the board. Of course, first, I uh, want to uh, recognize our boys basketball team. They are the state champions uh, for 2019, 6A champions. It was, yes. <laughs> It was just amazing being on the journey and um, knowing where they started and knowing how, how they ended and all that happened in between that time to get to this point. Uh, they had to overcome a lot and it really uh, demonstrated the character, their focus, the ability to persevere, uh, to push through a tough point in the season. Uh, they overcame a lot and so it was great to see them experience that moment and, um, and so they made us all proud so we'll recognize them uh, in an upcoming board meeting uh, but certainly wanted to uh, make sure that we uh, celebrated them uh, today in the superintendent's report um, also uh, we have uh, Duncanville High School Student Council uh, added a bone marrow registration drive to one of its major projects a spring blood drive and so the bone marrow drive, it'll be held Thursday, March 21st at Duncanville High School. Anyone can register students uh, seeking bone marrow for a classmate. So uh, have a class, as a, have a young person at Duncanville High School. And the students are really just rallying around uh, this young person in order to provide assistance and support uh, where it's needed. And it, again, just shows the dedication, the commitment uh, that our students have in supporting one another. So. I wanted to share that uh, with the board as well. Uh, we have uh, three of our art students. Uh, you see them there. Uh, Carolina Fletcher, uh, Ariana Kimball, and uh, Alejandra Taronis. Uh, last month, uh, they created artwork that qualified for the Texas Art Education Association State Competition. You see some of their work there. Uh, after receiving the highest awards at the regional contest, uh, they submitted their work uh, at the State Visual Arts Scholastic event uh, that's coming up in April. And so uh, because of their work, they're able to qualify for that event and uh, they received 42 awards overall from uh, 1,251 works that were submitted. Only 109 advanced to state and these students were part of the 109 that advanced. So we're really proud of the work uh, that they uh, have done. And then just the, the last report that I have for you on uh, this evening, board members, just to uh, uh, give you an update, we are in the process of planning and developing our budget. Uh, and so we are on point to have a budget workshop uh, April the 8th, I believe the date is April the 8th coming up. And so uh, I have been in meetings, I've gone through the process of looking at the two uh, dominant bills that are out there, House Bill 3 and Senate Bill 3. We have already developed a comparative analysis to determine how each one of those bills are going to impact Duncanville ISD, and we'll be prepared to break that down for you uh, on April. Uh, but today, I joined 24 superintendents uh, in signing a memo that is addressed to the Speaker of the House, Dennis Bonin, uh, Governor Abbott, our Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and uh, Dan Uberty, who's uh, Public Education Committee Chairman, and Larry Taylor, who is Public Education Committee Chairman. I will send this document to you uh, in an email later on this evening just so that you have it. But I wanted to uh, share this with you that uh, several superintendents in the DFW area, but all across the state, we sent this uh, information to the individuals that I listed and basically advocating for higher salaries for teachers, but also for uh, teachers to be, for our most effective teachers uh, to uh, be awarded with financial incentives. And so there are a number of districts that have some of these financial incentive 
uh, programs as a part of their evaluation system. And so we're advocating that the state put this in one of the bills that they are uh, championing at this point uh, and that they strengthen the language behind it. And so as superintendents are rallying around uh, this effort, this will help us, of course, to retain quality teachers, help us to reward those teachers who produce the best results with students, uh, and to hopefully increase uh, some of the challenges that we've had with hiring teachers with the dwindling pool of, the, of teachers or educators that are pursuing the traditional college educational track. And so uh, I'll send this to you. You can have that for your information to read, but it's just part of the advocacy that goes on during the budget process. And so uh, we are championing that effort and we'll continue to monitor uh, over the course of the session uh, as we work our way through uh, 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 April 8th when we present our first uh, look at the budget to you. So uh, those are the reports that I have for you this evening, Madam President. Thank you very much. We will now welcome Tierra Richard for recognitions. Good evening, Madam President, Board of Trustees, Dr. Smith. Um, as always, it's just a privilege to be able to come before you and, and really celebrate the great things happening in Duncanville ISD. Um, Dr. Smith, you always do a great job at really laying the groundwork and telling the story of what's happening in the district. But this is another opportunity for us to come forward and celebrate a student teacher and staff who were chosen out of all of the student teachers and staff throughout the entire district to be recognized here before you. So I'll start off with our um, teacher of the month, Ms. Tennille Jones. So, Ms. Tennille Jones is our teacher of the month who is made with pride in Duncanville. Uh, Ms. Jones is an eighth grade teacher um, who teaches social studies at Reed Middle School. Uh, she wears many, many hats at the school there. She's a department chair, a mentor teacher, an instructional support coach. She's also a member of multiple campus leadership groups and is always willing to volunteer for anything that's needed on her campus. She strives to provide quality education in a safe, productive, and engaged environment and is also a part of the school's instructional leadership team. Um, she was actually nominated by her principal, Mr. Brian Bird, and he said that she has such an impact on the campus that it really cannot be measured. And on top of that, if you've ever been into her classroom, the excitement she exhibits for those kids, I mean, it's unmatched. Um, it's amazing when she comes in and she celebrates the kids, she um, engages them, she reaches them where they are. And so she does such a wonderful job really taking care of those students and setting an example for other teachers to see how that works. Um, and so I just want to celebrate Ms. Tennille Jones. And what you may not know, she's actually my high school classmate. We graduated from high school together. I did not have any part in the voting. <laughs> I want to make that clear. But it's, it's always great to see people who do wonderful things and continue to grow um, from being in that classroom together to now seeing you really be celebrated as a teacher leading a classroom. I'm very, very proud of you. So our Made with Pride in Duncanville Teacher of the Month is Ms. Tennille Jones. Up next, we have our Made with Pride in Duncanville Staff of the Month, Ms. Liz Armendariz. <laughs> she didn't know she is my twin also. We dressed to like today. So Liz was nominated not by one or two or three people. She had about seven or eight nominations from her campus, uh, which you may not realize is made with pride nominations. They gather up over the months. Um, and if they're not selected, we continue to keep them in the pool. And so the nominations just kept coming in for her the longer we kept. We were like, we've got to recognize her at some point when you have that many nominations come in that are really, really celebrating all the wonderful things you do. So uh, 
really, all of your coworkers really went on and on about how caring you are, resourceful, and just your value to the school, not just to the school, but to every person who comes through that door. They feel welcome, they feel appreciated, they feel loved. From students to teachers to parents, everyone who comes through the door of Hastings really feels like they are celebrated and honored because of the way you treat them, how you take care of them. Uh, you're also the person who has the answer for everything. Um, anytime someone has a question, what is it, nine times out of 10 you got it? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so she's known also for just being involved in everything. She does extracurricular activities before, during, and after school. She celebrates teachers and students as often as possible. She's just always there for everyone on that campus. And um, everyone said that you just have a heart of gold, and they're so, so very appreciative of all that you do. So it is a pleasure to recognize you as our Made with Pride in Duncanville Staff of the Month, Ms. Liz Armendariz. Congratulations. Last but not least, we have a student who really is an amazing, amazing student. Not only an amazing student, but just an amazing um, just young woman. So I'd like to recognize our Made with Pride in Duncanville Student of the Month, Miss Gabby Goodgames. So Gabby is a sixth grader at Kinnemer Middle School. She is part of the STEAM Academy at Kinnemer Middle School. And you'll see she's holding something that um, she actually created herself. So as part of her, uh, the Shark Tank that they do there at STEAM, at the STEAM Academy, they present their businesses and ideas that they have. Well, she did that for the Shark Tank and also for the District Science Fair, which she placed. And her entrepreneurial gift um, is a subscription box for dogs. It includes homemade treats, soothing bombs, toys, and more. And she calls it the Possum Pamper Kit. And so anyone who's talked about how great this, um, this, this gift is, she actually has practiced on her own dog. She's in her room working as like a chemist, mixing oils, trying different scents and fragrances that work. Ms. Smith, the principal there at Kenimer, actually said she's tried a couple on her dog, and they really, really work. The calming has got her dog calmed down. He's relaxed. So, I mean, it's just a great idea. And she saw a need, saw a skill that she had to be able to enhance it, put it together in a kit. And she not only has presented it for the Shark Tank and the Science Fair, she also is selling this online. It's her business now. So this is something that she's created, and she's filling the gap in the community for. And so she actually has a possum, make sure I say it, a possum pamper kit, right? She has a possum pamper kit for each of you that we'll give you after the meeting so the ward members, you all have a copy, and, and Dr. Smith, you also have one too, so that you can share or use on your own pets or our gift if you don't have a dog of your own. Um, but these are the small kits that she's put together and just really celebrate. So she shows off what it means to have that entrepreneurial spirit and really go and get an idea and really advance it and take it to the next level. So it is with great honor and pride that we recognize Ms. Gabby Good Games as our main pride of the Real Student of the Month. And so while they're taking photos, we actually have a video to show you a little bit more about each of these candidates. Duncanville ISD congratulates the following student, staff member, and teacher who are made with pride in Duncanville. What makes me come into work every day is um, just being serviceable, um, being there for the teachers, uh, just doing the best that I can to make their job easier. Even if it's pencils for a teacher, I, okay, they need this, give them what they need, or if just being here um, 
it just brings me joy. I mean, I, I love what I do. I genuinely love what I do. I love helping people. It, there's a saying around here that they say, if, if I don't know, come ask Liz. <laughs> and nine out of 10, I can help them. So it's, it's all about attitude and just always having a smile for someone. Um, Cause you don't know if that's the only smile that person's gonna get. Um, Possum Pamper Kit is a kit that comes to you monthly full of all your dog's favorite things. It includes two packaged treats, one toy, one spray, and one bomb. I had to actually put actual effort in this and figure out what ways I could make the dog happy. Um, I feel like this can really support my college funds when I grow up and um, it'll help me improve more in my academics. I actually thought it would just be, you know, just a regular small business of mine, but actually it blew up a lot. I am proud to be the champion for kids in a city of champions. I think the qualities of a great teacher entail commitment, passion, patience, and just an understanding that not every child needs the exact same thing. Over the years, I've learned that, yes, we want all students to come for education, but some students actually just need love. And so you have to be able to decipher through what a student actually needs in order for a student to be successful. These honorees truly are made with pride in Duncanville. And as always, anytime you're celebrating um, these great individuals who deserve these honors, there are also, there's a team and a family behind them that are pushing them and encouraging them to be great. And so if we have any of the school staff, parents, um, school family who are here, would you please stand so we can recognize you also? Thank you. We will now move into the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? Madam President, I make a motion that we uh, accept the consent agenda as presented with the addition of um, items 6A, 6B, 6C, 6D, 6E, and 6F fr from the action agenda. <clears throat> Second. Okay, we have a motion from Tom Kennedy and a second from Phil McNeely to move items uh, from the action agenda, item 6A through F, to the consent agenda. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? So moved. I second it. Okay, we have a motion from uh, Tom Kennedy with the second from Renee McNeely. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. We will now move to action agenda item G. And the presenter is Melissa Gates. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board, and Dr. Smith. I am honored to have this motion before you, and I am, we're seeking a resolution to nominate our superintendent, Dr. Mark Smith, for superintendent of the year through TASB. TASB honors every year from each region the superintendent of the year, and it's a select group of superintendents with exemplary and visionary leadership. Once a superintendent from each region, region is selected, TASB will um, pull all of those superintendents together and choose one superintendent of the year for the whole state of Texas. Some of the performance criteria that superintendents of the year are judged on include student performance, administrative and school climate, board superintendent relations, fiscal management, personnel management, school community relations, and a few other categories. So tonight we have before you a resolution for the board to sign nominating our very own superintendent, Dr. Mark Smith, as superintendent of the year, which we believe he is well deserving of this honor. Thank you very much. I think I'd like to read the resolution now. Uh, dated March 18, 2019. 
whereas each year Texas Association of School Boards, TASB, honors outstanding superintendents for achievement and excellence in public school administration <laughs> with the Superintendent of the Year Award. These outstanding school leaders exhibit exemplary and visionary leadership toward improving school performance. They are chosen for their strong leadership skills, dedication to improving the quality of education in their districts, and commitment to public support and involvement in education. Whereas Dr. Mark Smith has served as superintendent in Duncanville ISD since April 2016, he is a member of the Texas Association of School Administrators, is certified and meets the state board for educator certification, continuing professional <coughs> education requirement, and will be an active superintendent at the time of the 2019 TASA TASB convention. And whereas Dr. Mark Smith is well deserving of the nomination of superintendent of the, of the year, now therefore be it resolved that the district board of trustees hereby nominates Dr. Mark Smith for TASB superintendent of the year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, board, for uh, your confidence and, so, and your support. Do I have a motion to consider approval of the resolution for superintendent of the year application? Madam President, I move to approve the resolution nominating Dr. Mark Smith for TASB superintendent of the year. <coughs> We have a motion by Tom Kennedy and a second by <coughs> Renee McNeely. Are there any questions, further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. We now move to action agenda item H, schematics and costs for the renovation of the old administration building for the Duncanville ISD Police Department, presented by Andrea Fields. Good evening, Madam President, and to uh, the board members and Dr. Smith and waiting audience. Uh, again, it's my pleasure to stand before you probably with another uh, leg of our work with our newly formed and organized Duncanville ISD Police Department. And so tonight, as you remember, board, you engaged Huckabee Architect Firm uh, to start the work at the former administration building for the schematic design and so with that, we have representatives from Huckabee Architects with us tonight. Uh, Mr. Andre Brackens, who is a principal with Huckabee, and Mr. Luke Powell, who is an associate principal. And they're going to come at this time to review the schematic design with you. Thank you, Ms. Fields. Uh, Madam President, members of the board, and uh, Dr. Smith, we are thankful for the opportunity to uh, come before you and present the schematic design for the Duncanville ISD uh, police station. And um, I will uh, present an overall and a uh, schematic for the site plan itself. And then my, my associate, uh, again, uh, Luke, will be able to uh, go into the details regarding the floor plan. You should have a, a packet before you, and I'll also reference um, uh, the presentation as we go through. It'll be a brief presentation, but uh, again, Duncanville ISD and, and Huckabee, we were able to uh, partner together, and um, we're looking at repurposing uh, the district's administration building located at uh, 802 South Main Street, the former administration building, into the Duncanville ISD uh, police station or police department. And we look forward to seeing this facility uh, become a unique place designed to house the district's growing uh, group of school resource officers, and it will also support uh, Duncanville ISD's initiative to create safe learning environments uh, where students succeed uh, and thrive. So again, we want to acknowledge, again, the vision uh, of Dr. Smith and certainly acknowledge uh, Ms. Fields and her team uh, who were instrumental in collaborating, making sure that the uh, building uh, was abated and the uh, demolition uh, started, the major demolition started, so that we can get in and do an assessment and then be able to uh, work out a design which we're presenting to you uh, today. So uh, if I get you to reference uh, page uh, two, which is the uh, overall site plan, uh, obviously you know the location at the corner of East Vineyard Road and uh, South Main Street. Uh, you see a schematic there that represents the proposed uh, police station 
uh, in the uh, blue color, and you'll also see uh, that there is proposed uh, parking, new ADA uh, ramps, and also uh, a new fire lane and access uh, off of South Main Street. And this new access is, is really a win-win as it will help uh, alleviate some of the uh, stacking that's on Main Street for Maryfield Elementary School. Uh, this will provide some on-site stacking, if you will, uh, that will help alleviate some of that. So it definitely would be uh, a win-win in terms of easing some of those items. The building is approximately 7,500 square feet, uh, and it is uh, basically, uh, it's a great location because it's very cost-effective. If I may use the term good bones, it has uh, good bones, and, and because of that, um, we're able to utilize uh, the existing structural system, the uh, e existing exterior walls, uh, the roof also has an existing warranty uh, on it, and so uh, it is just a, a very good use uh, of available funds. We'll talk about uh, the estimate in, in our latter page pages, uh, but also uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we definitely wanted to note is that uh, it'll also house uh, approximately a 1,200 square foot multi-purpose room that can be used um, uh, for the district in terms of training or whatever uh, purposes you may need. And this serves uh, as an autonomous uh, portion of it separated from the police station itself with its own entry and it can operate uh, autonomously and independently. So it would be just, a, again, another great resource space to use for training or whatever it is that you may need throughout the district. So uh, again, uh, that's the overall uh, site plan. And uh, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Luke, and he will uh, take you through the floor plan and uh, some of the uh, perspectives of the interior. Good evening, Madam President, Board of Trustees, Dr. Smith. Again, my name is Luke Powell, Associate Principal with Huckabee. As we were going through this plan and the program with Chief Hampton and Ms. Fields, uh, the building itself really lent itself well to, to what the program was. Uh, on the building's south side, uh, you can see which is your plan right. Uh, there are two exterior openings, uh, which <clears throat> oriented very well to the secured parking lot on the site that was requested. Uh, the area you see in green would be used for processing uh, complete separate entrance that they could bring individuals in that need to be in hold, holding cells. Uh, there are two holding cells with a restroom uh, centrally, lo centrally located so that individuals are not interacting with each other uh, as, as needed for restroom or any other activities. Um, then the <coughs> south entry on that right side would just be normal uh, everyday access for the police officers into the report writing area, which is an open office concept. Uh, adjacent to the report writing, uh, we have space for two sergeants uh, that would oversee day-to-day uh, -day activity of the officers. Uh, plan north next, next to the green, we have men's and women's locker room. Uh, then we've got on the south side of the corridor, we have a small office for a future lieutenant, a conference room. Uh, as you move up plan north, we've got a evidence storage next to the women's locker room. Uh, then we maintain the, the main two public entries. Um, as you can see, the <clears throat> the entry would be a, a secured entry. Uh, Chief Hampton's secretary would act as receptionist as well, having direct access and line of sight to that entry. As we move down the corridor and continue, we've got to the uh, briefing training room, which is large multi-purpose, which can be used for multiple functions within the police department. Off of the secretary's office is the chief's office. And south of the chief's office, we have dispatch, with the emergency manager office and then a separate toilet so that this area can be completely functioned within that space, within that, that, uh, that pod. We have a <clears throat> second conference room, interview room, a server room, a storage that could be used for either the training area or it could be used for the police department, however we deem necessary. Uh, Plan North, we do have a break room and then we get into the, you know, the support functions, uh, electrical rooms, janitor's closet. Uh, we did have to add a riser room at this square footage and this size, the city was going to make us uh, provide fire suppression in the building. <clears throat> On the planned north entry, completely separate and autonomous from the 
for the police department is the separate 1200 square foot training room that Mr. Brockins had discussed. This does have its own separate restroom facility. Uh, so it's completely separate from the police department. <coughs> However, if future growth is required, uh, it is set up that the police department <coughs> could grow into this area if needed. What you're looking at here is a axonometric of the building. This would be if we took the space and basically just cut off the, the ceiling. You can get a good feel of what the spaces are, um, the, the size of them, how they lay out. We discussed quickly the building entrance. <clears throat> We're looking to do a, a complete refresh of the building. We'd like to clean and paint the exterior, remove the, <coughs> the two existing canopies. We do want to pronounce the uh, the police entry, which is the slide on the right, uh, so that day-to-day <clears throat> -day activity, that is the main entrance. We will downplay the entrance of the training facility. I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Brackens. Well, a as we close, we, you see the uh, space program. Basically, this, uh, again, came from the meetings with uh, uh, Chief Hampton and uh, her team, and then also understanding Dr. Smith's vision from that standpoint. On the left, uh, you have the program of the spaces and the square footages, and uh, on the right, you have the opinion of the probable cost uh, based on square foot uh, estimates. And again, since this is schematic design, these are estimates. But you can see what's included. It's broken down uh, in terms of the uh, site work uh, and you see what's included in the site work and then the uh, building renovation again approximately 7,500 square feet uh, of interior build out and that includes a new fire suppression system you know, new interior partitions doors frames hardware floors uh, ceilings millwork and lighting uh, obviously techno technology and audio visual uh, clean and paint the exterior basically give it a, a curb appeal refresh if you will um, and uh, we, we mentioned uh, earlier the preventative uh, roofing maintenance is currently under warranty. So, uh, again, it was cost effective to leave that warranty intact and continue to get the remaining years uh, left out of the uh, roof from that standpoint. Uh, also, new RTU <coughs> replacements, so new HVAC uh, is included in that. New storefront uh, glass, uh, exterior doors, frames, and hardware uh, would be uh, also included. Uh, and that construction total comes out to be about 2.5 million and uh, a contingency amount of 100,000 and the, your furniture fixtures and equipment, your FF&E, uh, there's an allotment for that. And the estimated project total comes in at about $2.8 uh, million. And finally, here's a schedule. Um, uh, again, looking at uh, some of the milestones that we'd be looking at it would uh, if things proceed and should you uh, decide to proceed uh, with this project we would look at, be looking at about um, uh, completion about this time next year uh, actually uh, having it ready for uh, occupancy and that's just a breakdown uh, of each of our milestones and so that's the um, uh, presentation in summary and we'd be happy to address any questions that you may have I was just looking at the square footage of the different areas and things. <clears throat> and I yes, sir. That Chief Hampton's office is not, in my opinion, very large. But also in the schematic, it shows a secretarial office next to hers, and that doesn't show up on this list of offices. Mm -hmm. So is that 180 square feet in total, her office and the secretary's office? Yeah, that's not included. <clears throat> no, that, that area is not included. The, uh, the chief's office is 180 square feet. I think if we look at the program, I think it was yeah, 180 square feet. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the secretary's office should be about 120 additional to that. Yeah, so that's this one down here, emergency manager on the list of things? No, emergency manager is, is a, a separate office. Emergency manager actually falls under the 120 square feet. Uh, it tends to be a little bit larger just due to the layout of it. Uh, typical office space with a, with a desk and two chairs, two guest chairs is 120 square feet. Uh, typically, if you want to add in a com small conference table at just <coughs> the chief's office, 180 square feet is enough room for that. Uh, it just seems to me to be somewhat small for her office with the fact it's got a desk and a conference table and other things in there that's going to be quite cramped and quite crowded. I don't know whether there's anything you can do to make it larger or whether 
if anybody else feels about it, but it seems to be quite small to me. I don't know how Chief Hampton feels about it. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it looks pretty small, so I just want to make sure she has plenty of room for what she needs. We, at this point, we will have further discussions with, with Chief Hampton to, to, you know, really mold this a little more, um, and we'll have those discussions more, but what's going to go in each office, what storage needs are. Uh, so as we get through those, if some of these areas do need to increase or decrease, you know, we will address those. Okay, that's fine. I, w I would like to see her have a bigger office, too. Let me ask you a question. The, the training, I mean, the locker rooms, has there been any, any thought to, as we grow the force, how many people will fit in these men and women locker rooms? Right now, we've got the locker rooms as double tier lockers, so there would be 12 in here. Uh, it's my understanding that currently there are four to five officers within the yeah. department. Uh, so this would provide growth for up to uh, 12 officers within the district. <clears throat> we, in the okay. locker size shown also is about 24 by 24, so it is a larger office. Uh, so that double tier uh, does give enough mm -hmm. size to hang a uniform within the, within the locker. I have a couple of asbestos abatement questions. Um, <laughs> has it been finished? Is the asbestos abatement yes, complete? Yes. Okay, second question, was there much um, asbestos? And I ask this because this is not the first renovation. And um, when something's renovated, is it just the area that's going to be renovated, um, asbestos? tested and removed or when you go into a whole building is all the asbestos to have been removed it, it, it really depends on that renovation but this one in particular uh, it's my understanding there was a lot of asbestos. there was a lot enough to where this this building has been for the most part gutted. Gutted, there are yeah. no walls left inside of the uh, inside the ceilings are gone all the lighting's hanging if you go inside this space it is concrete block and slab and exposed structure, there is nothing here. Well, I mean, that just makes me think of the money we've spent in the past about asbestos abatement there. because so we had a renovation and then we added, we made big rooms into small rooms and I know there's just been a lot of hammering and, and change there and I just questioned the amount of asbestos that would still be there. And yeah. if there's there was a large amount, I'm thinking, that's, that's not good. A lot of times if the dollar amount of the renovation that you're doing is minimal, it's not cost effective to go in and abate the entire area. A lot of times they'll do what's called encapsulating. So they will not touch whatever that asbestos is and cover it up, which is what's been done in this building numerous times. Uh, with the amount of renovation that's going on in this building, asbestos abatement is the only way to go. Well, going forward, there would be none. There, there is none currently. I'm it losing my gone. voice like these two on either side of me, so that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Do I have a motion to consider approval of schematics and costs for the renovation of the old administration building for the Duncanville ISD Police Department? So moved. Second. Motion was made by Phil McNeely and seconded by Tom Kennedy. Are there any questions, comments? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> we now move to information agenda item A, School Health Advisory Council, SHAC report presented by Andrea Phipps. Again, board, it's my pleasure to stand before you um, and uh, present the annual School Health Advisory Council report. Of course, um, you're very familiar with the School Health Advisory Council or the SHAC, uh, and 
Uh, this year we've had a really um, uh, wonderful uh, turnout in regard to our uh, team, our parents, our community members. And so uh, on this first slide, you see uh, some of the folks who were at our first uh, meeting um, where we had a presentation by Ms. Dana Harper. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that uh, as we move forward. Of course, the mission statement there for the School Health Advisory Council, of course, it is advisory uh, to the Board of Trustees. And it's really to promote and development of healthy lifestyle behaviors uh, for our students and our staff. And so this comes straight from our school policy regarding our School Health Advisory Council. This current school year, you see our uh, School Health Advisory team members. Uh, you see the parents there. We had a really good turnout of parents. Uh, Miss uh, Rachel Gonzalez Macon is a parent at Smith Elementary, and she served as our chair. Uh, you see the community members there, perhaps some familiar names who served before, but then also we have a couple of new uh, community uh, persons, and of course, a number of outstanding school uh, staff members. At the bottom, you see our board, our meetings uh, that we uh, held this year. We met in October, November. We met in February, and we have one more meeting, which will be held in April. Uh, last year, we spent a lot of time with the uh, School Health Advisory Council uh, focusing on our district wellness plan. If you all remember, I came and we talked about the school lunches and uh, et cetera, and that was really driven by what the uh, state required for us to do regarding our policy and our wellness plan. And so uh, in October when we met uh, together, we uh, talked about what our focus would be this year, and the focus really for our uh, shack was centered around mental health and prevention. As you all are very familiar in uh, the governor's uh, focus, um, his safety action plan, and we took some of the tenets from that, which drove our discussion this year, really being proactive and not reactionary, <coughs> dealing with what kind of resources we have available for our students and our staff when they're in crisis, when they need support. And so we spent a lot of time, and so we started really talking internally on uh, what Duncanville ISD has to share with our students in regard to uh, mental health. I think this was in our second meeting. You see Dana Harper, our Director of Counseling, and she really presented to our team uh, under the title Serving and Supporting Students in Crisis, and she really did an awesome job uh, sharing with the uh, Council, all of the many resources we have within the district from our, our counselors, our school counselors, all the way to other organizations and groups uh, that support our students who sometimes need a little extra um, uh, helping hand, perhaps family situations, et cetera, and how those resources can be accessed by the school personnel. That same day, our own Chief Hampton presented an overview of what the school police officers have in place regarding mental health. And one of the things she shared with us, which was most helpful and parents were not aware, is that one of our officers that we have on staff right now uh, is a uh, fully certified mental health crisis uh, officer. And so responding to incidents, perhaps even in our school sometimes, we have someone on our staff, so we're very fortunate. She shared with us how they work in partnership with the school counselors, the principals, et cetera, because many times we do have students who need some special assistance. So they both did a phenomenal job really highlighting what we have in place in Duncanville. Um, in our February meeting, uh, familiar name there, Dr. Alan Lockhart, who uh, is the coordinator for public schools outreach for the turnaround agenda, uh, spoke to our team and he talked about what they have. They're one of our great partners and they're right here in Duncanville. And many of the parents who attended were not, they weren't familiar with the turnaround agenda, so he shared with them about their clothes closet, the other support they have for, for families that need public assistance with the uh, their uh, 
utility bills, et cetera. And so we have really a real safety net. And so that's been our focus again, as I said, this year. Other things, there was a young lady that's uh, volunteered to serve who's from the Prairie View A&M Cooperative Extension Program who's working with our career tech uh, program. And they're really looking at health science. And so she talked about some of the support that, that they have through that group. And then finally, uh, just one thing that was not dealing with mental health but was of interest to our parents, of course, was what we were doing at that time, and it was in February, uh, to prevent the flu. And we talked about what our maintenance department has in place, our e mist machines. If you recall, I mentioned those last year where we, um, on schedule, we really missed every facility in the district and has really minimized our outbreak of flu we didn't have. Uh, we had the flu surveillance, as uh, Ms. Navarra, our lead nurse, talked about, that we didn't have any schools within the district that reached a threshold where she had to report us to the Dallas County Health Department. So we were very, very fortunate with that. But our main focus this year uh, was on uh, school uh, mental health and what we have to support our students. And that concludes my report, if you have any questions. Thank you very much. I, I, I do have a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, one question about um, the flu season. Yes, ma'am. If a child does come to school and, and say the child has 103 temperature and it's 9 a.m., well, when the parent or whoever, um, I assume, picks the child up from school, uh, are, they, are, are they given these? I mean, we all get these advisories when to stay home, but are parents really told to really look at these and it, that it really matters and um, how, how forceful are we with these? Because I mean, a child comes to school and you've infected maybe not just only a classroom, but 10 doorknobs along the way. I mean, are, are, I don't want the hand slap, but I mean, is it, is it a strengthy push to have parents read these? That's probably out of my realm of. Well, okay. <laughs> that means the that's I that's something that you want to talk about. It? All, all right. Just for a minute, you can stay there. Don't worry. <laughs> just for a minute. I don't want any mighty four shoes, but the parents just need to know how important that is. Well, well, thank you for for asking the question. Uh, Mrs. Navarro's not here, but we talk about those processes all the time, so we can't guarantee that a parent will actually read it and follow it to the letter, we can't guarantee that. But what the nurses are very, uh, very, very good at is providing in layman's terms to those parents what they need to do, what the next steps are, where the child is, and they try their best to, they can't administer any medicine or anything, but they can call those parents, get them prepared so when they do come to pick the child up, they're ready to take the child home and administer whatever that medication may be, or normally it may be Tylenol or anything else according to what the parent may want. But nurses are very good at serving those communities and helping those parents transition those kiddos and actually sharing with them the amount of time it may take before they can come back and then checking on those child or children and, and with their parents on a regular basis to see if they're okay. But I can't guarantee, and we haven't heard that they're actually sharing information and requiring them to read anything or any materials at all. Because a lot of times they may not have time to do that. Does that, make, does that answer your question? Yes, and I have one more. Okay. <laughs> um, a little bird told me that sometimes our clinics run out of supplies, uh, just ordinary supplies. Mm -hmm. And I, ages ago, PTAs would, you know, buy Band-Aids or little underwear or, or whatever the need might be. But our clinic budgets, um, are, they, are they given by us or does each principal designate amount of his or her budget for that school clinic? Well, the how, clinic how does, does that work? The Mrs. Navarro, she does provide assistance to all of her nurses in the district, but I'm not sure what the limit is uh, because I haven't reviewed that completely. But if they do run out of supplies or anything along those lines, principals are more than capable of pulling resources together to provide whatever those children need along with counseling. So counselors can get involved as well too. So there are lots of different entities on a campus that will be able to provide some assistance in case they run out of supplies. So is that a concern? Sure, it always is because the need may be higher on one campus or another. 
but with that team concept and the principal and all the other support teams on the campuses, they're able to provide uh, whatever those children need, even if they have to go and get it themselves, I'm certain that they'll be able to do that. And then if they need more support, they can always call my department or someone in our department or Mrs. Harvard's department in counseling and we'll make it happen for them so they're not uh, without for very long. Okay, thank you. I guess you can sure be thing. seated now. All right. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Bigby was going to clear up on the budget. Davis. Dr. Bigby has another they comment. Allocate that money out of their per people allocation. They, they allocate the money for the <coughs> Function 33, which is health services. Of course, the salaries are all paid centrally, but, but it is the principal's responsibility to do that. But we've. Uh, okay, so it's not, not like we. It's not like we budget clinics. No. And each school is allotted this much, this much, and this much for student population. It's just, it comes out of the principal's right. budget. Which, okay. Which is determined by enrollment and at yeah. risk students. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bigby. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Fields and Mr. Copeland and Dr. Bigby. Appreciate the help. We now move to information agenda item B, summer programs presented by Kathy Sewell. Good evening, Madam President, Dr. Smith, and members of the board. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sylvia Martinez, who is heading up our summer program, um, all the programs that we have for the summer. So I'm going to turn it over to her and um, allow her to give you a quick update. Good evening, Madam President, trustees, Dr. Smith. I'm going to give you an overview of the updates that we have up till now as it relates to our summer school programming, both including our core programming and enrichment programs. So our programs and locations have been determined, and as you see on the left, the building that we'll be using for bilingual summer school, extended school year, and enrichment camps is Bill Hartz Elementary School. In the middle, we do have our Kenimer Middle School, where we'll be having our middle school star prep, middle school credit recovery, and again, several enrichment camps. And at our Duncanville High School, we'll have our EOC retest prep, high school acceleration and credit recovery, extended school year. And I'll give you a little more information on those enrichment camps coming forward. Our summer school dates are June 3rd through 28th. We will run our summer school Monday through Thursday. Our credit recovery and acceleration programming will be from 8 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. and also offered in the afternoon from 12 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Our STAR prep program ends on June 25th. That's when our testing will occur for our students. And our programming will run Monday through Thursday, 8 to 12.30 p.m. And then we'll also have our EOC prep both morning and afternoon. So let's find out a little bit more about our programming priorities. We have transformed our learning model and a focus on enrichment. We saw that integrated in our 2018 summer programming, so we're going to repeat a lot of that in our curriculum. Uh, we'll continue to offer specialized services to our students, and I'll tell you a little bit more about our bridge programs as well. So our transformed learning model, we see hands-on, engaged instruction for our students. Our curriculum department works to tailor and create unique lessons for our students during the summer. And as you see, our focus enrichment includes our TSI camp, college readiness camp, gate creativity camp, PSAT boot camp, GT STEM camp, our design connect create physics, girl start, which is STEM for girls, Engineering for Kids STEM Camp, Pipeline to Pathways, our Summer Engineering, also Girls in Engineering Mathematics, which is our GEMS program, and then the C3 Camp, Camp Career Connect and Skills for Living, which is one of our special education programs. Most of these programs are already confirmed and approved and budgeting is in place. Some of them are pending and our directors are working diligently to get those finalized. Specialized services, we see services such as bilingual education, gifted and talented, our skills for living, extended school year, programming that's seen normally throughout our school year, but then extended into the summer as well. Our bridge programs focus on a lot of our choice programming, our uh, Duncanville High School Collegiate Academy, our D Duncanville P-TECH architectural design. As you're aware, we have our STEAM at the Kenimer, and then our health sciences coming in at Bird and business tech at Reed Middle School. 
Our summer school checklist, we've been working diligently. We have a full team effort that works together to make sure that our programming is in place for our students. We've met a couple of times already with our summer school committee, and many of our uh, timelines have already been set and put into place. We have our traditional programming, our enrichment programming, and bridge programming, as I just spoke to, putting in place our registration processes and course offerings, updating our summer school handbook, and then the department responsibilities, such as budgets, facilities, technology, transportation, hiring processes and all of those pieces have been put in place as well. Any questions, comments? Yes, sir. Uh, back over here on the list of uh, focus on enrichment. <coughs> yes, sir. We have uh, a GT STEM camp and then a girls in engineering met a, uh, I'm sorry, not the right one, the girls start STEM for girls. Yes, sir. Since our whole program is geared around STEAM, which includes the arts, are we just gonna forget arts during the summer and not have them in these programs? Because I think we all know that kids that participate in arts <coughs> excel in, in those other programs. And I would think that we wanna keep enriching those kids in the arts as well during the summer, as well as the science and technology and engineering and math. Sure, I appreciate that perspective. And what I can do is go back to the director that's supporting that area. What happens sometimes with some of our programs, it's an outside entity that brings a set curriculum. Beyond that, I mean, if our focus is STEAM, then I think our summer enrichment should have that same focus. Absolutely, and I'll share that feedback. Okay, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. We now move to information agenda item C, student parking regulations presented by Chief Hampton. Good evening, board, trustees, Madam President, and Dr. Smith. It's an honor to stand before you tonight as I talk about the student parking regulations while parked at DHS campus. As a result of some recent school shootings, such as Parkland, Florida, Santa Fe, Texas, Governor Abbott drafted a plan to enhance the safety and security in our public schools. We all know that campus security, as well as facility security, begins at the perimeter. DHS is our biggest target within the district and this is where we start our assessment. The purpose of this regulation is to control the traffic and have an effect on the driver's behavior to ensure the safety and welfare of all persons on DHS campus. We get the authority from the Education Code, which basically adopted the state traffic law to apply to school property. The challenges that we face we often receive calls for service where unidentified subjects are sitting in cars on the campus. Some are students and some are not. The students, staff, faculty, and visitors always tend to seem to park in each other's designated spots, which makes it hard for us to determine who belongs and who does not. Fire department often express their concerns about vehicles parking in unauthorized areas on DHS campus. We bring the dogs back in school as a security, tax, as a security tool and they're gonna be conducting interior and exterior searches. While conducting the exterior searches, if a dog hit on the vehicle, that vehicle does not have a permit, then of course it make it challenging for officers to determine who drove the vehicle on the property that day. Looking at the rules, <clears throat> in order for a student to obtain a parking permit, they're gonna to have to one, submit a parking application, they're gonna to have to have valid driver license, and they're gonna to have to have proof of valid uh, liability insurance. That proof of liability insurance is going to actually have to have the driver's name attached to that particular proof of insurance before they can receive a, a permit. Of course, the purchase location, we're going to be a part of the 2019-2020 registration at DHS, at DHS, and they'll be able to purchase the parking permits there. Of course, they're going to be able to park, purchase it at the 802 South Main Street, which you've seen earlier is going to be the headquarters for the police department, and they'll also be able to purchase it at our current location there at DHS. The fees that you see there, of course, uh, $20 for the students. Uh, if, there's a, if, there, if there are siblings uh, in the same household, the parent will not have to pay an additional $20. They will only have to pay $5 for that additional um, permit. And if the, per, if the students can per, uh, show that they had a permit issued to them, and for whatever reason uh, that permit has been uh, taken off of the vehicle, uh, then they will be able to pay $2 for a replacement decal. 
This is just to show an example of what the student parking permits look like. Uh, the student will also have the opportunity to obtain a temporary parking permit, and this temporary parking permit can be obtained on days that, say for instance, students have mechanical issues with their vehicle and they have to drive an alternate vehicle, with whether it's a rental vehicle or a parent vehicle, then they will be able to obtain a temporary parking permit for the time that they drive in that vehicle in order to still park there on campus legally. Parking violations, of course, will be listed on the uh, application in which the student will receive in order to submit for the permit. Uh, there will be parking citations issued for the violations that are observed there on campus. Uh, that parking citation will be $20 in fee, which is the same as for the permit. And it is a possibility that a vehicle can be uh, booted and or towed, but I can assure you tonight that before a vehicle is booted and or towed, every effort possible, there will be every effort possible to resolve the matter uh, before it goes to that point. And it should also be noted that the administrators will be issuing uh, school discipline for parking violations. Uh, so at that particular time, it's guaranteed that a parent will be contacted each time a student is dealt with regarding parking issues that would help us manage uh, a vehicle being towed or booted prior to it getting to that level. There is also an appeal process. The student has 10 days to appeal from the issuing of the citation. On that 11th day, the appeal will not be accepted. The driver that was driving the vehicle on the date that the citation was issued is going to be the individual that's responsible for submitting the paperwork for that appeal. And myself and our designee is going to be responsible for uh, managing uh, this appeal process. We know that changes uh, impacts organizations. So in order to have the least amount of impact to the organization possible, we're starting with the student body first. Uh, when we start with the student body, this will give us the opportunity to not only test the process, but make any tweaks and adjustments that we need to prior to implementing it and rolling it out district-wide to all faculty and staff, which is our ultimate goal. I'm prepared to answer any questions for you at this time, if you have any. Okay, Carla. Uh, thanks, Chief. Um, will these rules be implemented in the 2019-2020 student handbook? Yes, so that's that all. Yes, that, that is a, starts. that is a, yes, we are planning to make sure that it, it shows there in the student handbook. Okay, and my second question would be, currently, how many cars have permits at the high school? From my understanding, there are approximately probably about maybe 80 cars that have. How many? 80. 80. That current have, currently have permits. Okay, thank you. They don't have to have permits or are they supposed to have permits? Everyone on the student parking lot should have permits. They're okay. supposed to have student permits. Tom? I have two questions. One about the uh, second sticker. Mm -hmm. So if a, <coughs> a parent has two teenagers and they're both driving, do they have to have two separate stickers or can they use that second sticker for $5 <coughs> on the second car? Well, they, they need to have two separate stickers because the stickers really identify the vehicle. Well, that's what I thought. But right. the way I read the way that reads, I don't understand the need for a second student, if they're driving the same car, to have a, a permit. If the right. car is permitted, then... And, and this is where if, there are, if each student is driving a different vehicle, they can't drive the same vehicle. So if there are siblings in a household and both of them are driving a different vehicle, then they both have to have permits for each vehicle that they're driving. I understand, but is, is the first one 20 and the second one's five? Yes. Based on what you said over here? Yes. Okay. And that's to kind of give the parents a break so they won't have to pay $40 that's for both of their that. students to be able to drive to school. Make sure that's what it was. Yes. Uh, the second question I have is, <clears throat> are, all, are all the students going to park over on the West Campus parking lot? Are we going to designate areas around? Because I know right now I think they can park in various areas depending on what their classification is. Right. So it'll, it'll, it'll go as it, it, it currently is. All of the students <laughs> will be required to park on the student parking lot. The only other area where students are allowed to park is going to be Sandra Meadows, and those are the athletes that are allowed to park in the Sandra Meadows parking lot, and they have to have a special hang tag in addition to their permit. And this is because they come back late after games, and instead of having to walk over to the west parking lot, they're right there, uh, and their vehicle is accessible to them for them to safely get them and leave. Okay. Are we going to allow the kids to, uh, I know some schools do this, and I don't know whether we, we don't currently, but I think it's kind of cool, it's a fundraiser type thing to allow the kids to buy a parking spot and to paint it and decorate it to suit their own, within limits obviously, but <laughs> to suit their own uh, personal. Right, and that's what they're currently doing now and that's something that we can do for the uh, upcoming year as well. 
It's just, it's a great, I, I see it at all the other schools we visit when we go to the games and stuff. Where they right. The, the parking lot. And it's an additional fee for that, so yeah, if they're well, willing yeah, to pay that pay additional parking, fee, then we'll like be willing to sell it. Spot, so right. Sure. We have that, we have that little parking area on the uh, west side, mm -hmm. over by the ninth grade yeah, side, because they've got about. the little painted yes, things there. Okay. So we right. still do that. Yes, ma'am, they mm -hmm. currently do that. Okay, I didn't, I haven't been over there in a while, so I didn't know that, but that's good. All right. Okay, any other questions? We. I just want to say we've come a long way. Back in my day, they just said park between the lines. <laughs> <laughs> well, there will still be a requirement. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Chief Hampton. All right. Appreciate your All report. Right. <laughs> we now move to communications from citizens, and we have none. Thank you for coming to the meeting. Being that there are no further items to discuss, this meeting is adjourned.